Hey guys, this is Justin. Hello and welcome to another Star Wars Battle Breakdown video. Today we will be looking at Rogue Squadron's unbelievable victory at the Battle of Typhara, a victory which not only won the back to war, but also provided the New Republic with their first ever Super Star Destroyer, the Lusankia. Now, there's a lot of context needed for the actual battle itself, so I'm sort of going to split this video up into two parts. The first part will be the prelude with the setup, and then the second part will be the battle itself. I'll put timestamps on screen in case you want to skip around to just the final battle or whatever else. Let's get started though. In 7 ABY, the New Republic, after months of planning, captured Coruscant. As I covered in my recent chronology of the post-Endor Legends timeline, between Thrawn, the Dark Empire, and Abeloth, Coruscant was in for a very rough few decades, but at this point, there was one very pressing issue, the Krytos virus. The Krytos virus, which targeted aliens and caused an incredibly painful and unpleasant death, had been unleashed purposefully by Imperial Head of State Azani Isard as she fled the planet. Her plan was to bleed the New Republic dry, as the Krytos virus was only treatable with the very expensive medical agent known as Bacta, and to hurt general confidence in the new government. What's worse, Azani Isard was about to do everything she could to make Bacta very, very scarce, leading to, unsurprisingly, the Bacta War, where Azani Isard in the New Republic fought for control of the galaxy's Bacta as the lives of trillions hanged in the balance. So, Isard traveled to the planet Typhara and was able to take control of the Zukfra Bacta cartel and was also elevated to Typharan head of state, essentially controlling a significant portion of the galaxy's Bacta during a time when the New Republic, of course, needed it more than ever. In what I think was a fairly dubious call, the New Republic refused to authorize a campaign against Isard, with the argument being that they'd be interfering with the self determination of the sovereign state, which of course would be a major turnoff for any systems looking to join the New Republic. Isard technically hadn't invaded Typhara, she had been made chief of the Zukfra Bacta Corporation and was just essentially head of state. Now, I call this dubious because Isard was a war criminal who had attempted to genocide trillions upon trillions of sentient beings. I think it actually looks worse for the New Republic not to respond to this, but whatever. Because the New Republic would not act, Wedge, Cornhorn, and other members of Rogue Squadron resigned and publicly declared that they would liberate Typhara, beginning their private war against Isard. Rogue Squadron was completely without formal support of the New Republic, although they did have access to 10 million credits and saw popular support within the galaxy. Various members of the New Republic Navy also continued to work with Rogue Squadron in an unofficial context. Their fighters, for example, were listed as surplus in a way that made them very easy for them to pick up. And by working with Pash Kraken, they were able to secure a base of operations in the Yogdul system. Now, this was a perfect location, because Yogdul was midway between Coruscant and Typhara, it was within the response radius of Pash Kraken's fighter squadron. If the rogues needed help, it would probably not be considered by Isard. And it was actually an Empress class space station, which itself was somewhat defensible. Additionally, Rogue Squadron secured the assistance of Twi'lek freedom fighters and reached out to various smuggler groups. Rogue Squadron's mission was to liberate Typhara. That required both successfully taking the planet on the ground and eliminating space resistance, the latter of which will be the main focus for this video. The Empire had four ships, the Super Star Destroyer Lusankia, the Imperial Star Destroyer's Avarice and Virulence, and the Victory Star Destroyer Corruptor. Making matters more difficult was the fact that the rogues needed to avoid destroying the Lusankia as there were New Republic prisoners on board, prisoners Cornhorn had promised to free. Rogue Squadron was clearly outgunned so their strategy was very rebel in nature. They were going to spread out Azani Isard's capital ships, and they would do so by raiding the Bacta convoys leading Typhara. This would not only harm Isard's bottom line, but would also allow the free sending of Bacta across the galaxy, and would force Isard to dedicate her ships to defensive duties, thus splitting them up. Additionally, the rogues also supported local Typharan rebel groups, just to help ferment the chaos. 
This strategy was actually very successful. The rogues deprived Isard of over a billion credits of profit during their first raid and were also whittling down Imperial fighters, especially during hit and run attacks. Isard, however, responded brutally by bombarding worlds, which accepted free Bacta and also subjugating the local Vratex of Typhera. As the campaign progressed, the Victory Star Destroyer Corruptor was destroyed at the Alderaan Asteroid Field, where Rogue Squadron also gained control of the Alderaan War Cruiser Valiant. Later, Ser Lanka, commander of the ISD Avarice, defected to the Rebel Alliance alongside his ship and his crew, with the ISD being renamed the Freedom. This brings us to the actual battle itself. By now, Rogue Squadron had accumulated money, assets, support, and even famed smuggler Booster Tarek, who was running the logistics side of their station. They were ready for a final confrontation against Isard, fearing her increasingly unhinged and aggressive action against local civilian populations on Typhara and neighboring systems. The Rogues had been trading with Talon Card, but had discovered a mole within his operation who had been leaking information to Isard. They used this to set the ultimate trap. I'll explain. First, Rogue Squadron purchased several hundred torpedo launchers. The launchers themselves were separated from their targeting systems and formed the basis of an incredibly risky plan. You might need a bit of background here. Active targeting systems in the Star Wars universe, like those on munitions launchers, are detectable by enemy ships, which is why you hear pilots in Star Wars talk about target locks and whatever else. The ordnance in the actual launchers were attached to freighters, while the the targeting systems were placed on the Empress space station. This dramatically increased the apparent power of the Empress, because any ship which attacked it would see hundreds of torpedoes locking on. Of course, the Empress was all bark and no bite, because as I mentioned, the missiles themselves were on the freighters. On the other hand, Rogue Squadron set up a system where the missile and torpedo loaded freighters would slave their targeting to the telemetry of Rogue Squadron's snub fighters. Basically, an X-Wing could get a target, feed it to the freighters, and they could almost covertly launch the missiles. Additionally, before the battle, Talon Card also supplied the Empress with both a gravity well projector and a series of powerful tractor beams. The battle started with the purposeful leak of the rogue base at Yagdul through Card's agent who was unaware that her cover had been blown. Isard responded by sending her two final ships, which immediately upon arriving at Yagdul, headed towards the station and disgorged their fighters. Rogue Squadron alongside the Corellian ship and the various freighters immediately fled the system, but the ISD and the Lusankia were not concerned as Typhara did have a local defense fleet. However, as the Lusankia approached the station, Booster Tarek demanded that it surrender, turned on the gravity well projector, preventing a jump for hyperspace, and locked the ship with both the powerful tractor beams preventing it from moving, and hundreds of fake target locks. The Lusankia, which could be overwhelmed by this amount of firepower, immediately tried to escape but was held in place. That is until the virulence moved between the station and the tractor beams, allowing the Lusankia to escape, but before it could retrieve its fighters. As the Lusanki completes its 12-hour journey back to Typhara, Rogue Squadron has arrived alongside the freighters and the war cruiser. However, the rogues have another ace up their sleeve, the ISD Freedom, which is sitting on system's edge, ready to enter combat. The Lusankia, again without fighter support, arrives and pushes towards Typhara, immediately noting the New Republic presence. Local Typharan Home Defense Corps fighters are also sent from the planet in waves, but the pilots are relatively green and easily fall to Rogue Squadron and their allies. The New Republic slash Rogue Squadron plan here is very tricky. They're basically relying on deception and numerical superiority, but also dealing with the fact that no single ship even the ISD can survive prolonged fire from the Lusankia. So what we'll see throughout the battle is that they essentially try to cycle whichever target appears deadliest to the Lusankia, thus ensuring that no single element of their fleet is under prolonged fire for too long. The fighters, the ISD Freedom, and the war cruiser attack simultaneously. The rogues push through several lines of green fighters, while the Freedom aggressively pushes towards the ISD, rolling so it's 
main batteries on both sides can fire at the Lusankia. The old Iranian war cruiser, which is generally seen as not a threat, positions itself near the Lusankia's engines, away from most of its weapons. Lusankia focuses most of its fire on the Freedom, which is sustaining heavy damage already. Rogue Squadron pushes towards the Super Star Destroyer, relying on the distraction and the fact that they're too small to reliably hit. On their approach, Rogue Squadron notes gun positions on the vessel, and when within optimal firing range, launches proton torpedoes towards a single location. The 20 torps of the squadron wouldn't have been enough to do damage on their own, but to the surprise of the Empire, over 80 missiles and torpedoes hit the Lusanki's starboard side, breaking the shield and impacting the hull. At this point, the Lusanki has nearly crippled the Freedom, but its firepower is drastically reduced as the freighters were also targeting individual gun batteries. Rogue Squadron's strategy is well summed up by this line from the book, which I quite like. As ordered lead, Korn pulled the trigger on his stick and watched two proton torpedoes streak away at their target. Pull the Lusanki's fangs and hope we don't get gummed to death on the way out. Seeing the freighters now as the major threat, the Super Star Destroyer shifts fire in their direction, but the rogues continue guiding missile attacks and the Freedom now is given a chance to recover and also successfully launches a massive broadside doing serious damage to the now de-shielded Dreadnought. However, things are still fairly up in the air at this point because the freighters are being picked off very quickly, the Freedom itself is heavily damaged and Rogue Squadron just will not be able to survive indefinitely so close near a Super Star Destroyer. The turning point comes with the appearance of the Virulence, the ISD which had been caught by the tractor beams at Yog duel As the Empire celebrated and the Rogues prepared to die in a flash of glory, it's revealed that this ship is no longer an Imperial commanded vessel and that it had surrendered to Booster Tarek. Additionally, the Virulence is now housing Pash Kraken's A-Wing Squadron, which had conveniently been pulled out of hyperspace by the Empress's interdiction field. The Virulence brutalizes the port side of the now shieldless Executor, and the Corellian Cruiser, which had been hiding near its rear side, destroys its engines. Elsewhere on the battlefield, Kornhorn's squadron is dispatched to chase down a squadron containing a fleeing Azani Isard, though she would survive. Eventually, Wedge calls the weaponless, shieldless, and defenseless Lusankia, and and offers surrender. The captain, who had been going more and more mad with power throughout the battle, actually declines and threatens to ram the super ship into Typhera, but he's killed by an officer on the bridge, and the Lusankia and her crew formally surrender. This is the end of the battle, and it's an amazing victory for the New Republic. And I say New Republic because, conveniently, Rogue Squadron's resignation is never formally logged. In total, the Rogues lose a couple of fighters, but gain two captured Star Destroyers and a Super Star Destroyer. Well, they gain one captured Star Destroyer. The Virulence would be kept by Booster Tarek, who would rename it the Errant Venture and would turn it into a commercial ship. Lusankia, on the other hand, would earn its legendary status primarily during the Yuzhan Vong War, where it would end its life by ramming a Yuzhan Vong world ship. But guys, that's all I have for you today. I hope you enjoyed this battle breakdown. I want to give a special shout out to my friend Corey, who provided me with the image that I used for the Empress model. It's from his Empire War Mod, Thrawn's Revenge, and he's also done his own battle breakdown of this battle, completely different than mine, in 3d which i'll link below but guys that's all for now until next time be safe have a good one and may the force be with you